We're beginning this series today talking about hope, talking about this campaign, talking about the way Christ is calling us to prepare the way, just as he called John the Baptist. Our theme verse is found in your bulletin. I'd encourage you to pull it out. It comes from the very beginning of Mark's gospel, where Mark quotes a prophecy from Isaiah regarding to the work of John the Baptist. Let us read this together. Look, I am sending my messenger before you. He will prepare your way, a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. This is the call of John the Baptist. John the Baptist's job was to be the messenger, the forerunner, to prepare the way for the Messiah, to tell everyone that Jesus was coming. And for so many reasons, when we run a church, when we have a church building, when we organize, we're doing that same work that John the Baptist did. We don't change lives. We don't bring salvation. God does. And one of the things that we get to do as a church is to create space and opportunities for God to move. So we start programs and we build buildings and we gather together in groups so that God can show up in those powerful ways. It's our job to follow in the example of John the Baptist and prepare the way and make space for God to move. And that's the idea behind our campaign, that we are caring for our community, caring for our church, and preparing the way for God to continue working the way God always has. Today we are celebrating and saying thank you to all of those who helped to get us where we are today. And there's a scripture that I want to read here today. It comes from the book of Hebrews. If you brought your Bible with you, it's near the end. I'll give you time to find it as I do because I forgot to mark it this morning. It is near the end. The flip method hopefully will work since that's what I'm using. Nope, I'm not there yet. You know, I can almost give it from memory, but I'll, I'll find it. Here we are. See how professional we are, Edlin? We are just a well-oiled machine here. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. So then, let us also run the race that is laid out in front of us, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Let us throw off any extra baggage, get rid of the sin that trips us up, and fix our eyes on Jesus, faith's pioneer and perfecter. He endured the cross, ignoring the shame for the sake of the glory that was laid out in front of him, and sat down at the right hand of God's throne. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God, speak to us and we will listen. This is your house, and we have had a hand in building it, but it is your house, and we trust you that you will speak to us today as we dedicate this building and prepare the way for you to do even greater things. Be with us, O God. We are here for you. In your name we pray. Amen. This text today talks about our ancestors, those who have gone before us. And we read this text on All Saints Sunday every year. The first Sunday in November is All Saints Sunday where we remember all of those who have passed away in the last year and throughout history. It's a day where we honor those saints that have gone on to live in glory. And when I first experienced All Saints Sunday, growing up in the church, when I first heard this scripture read, talking about ancestors, I had a hard time relating to it. Because I don't know any of my ancestors. I don't know a lot of my family lineage. I don't know where we're from. I know, like, to my great-grandmother. That's about as far back as I know. Now, I know people in my family have done that research, but we don't carry those stories in our family. I don't carry those recipes in my family. We don't have a lot of that. A lot of that's because we moved around a lot when I was younger. I didn't get a cool name passed down to me. Um, I'm not Alex Williams III or some, you know, long lineage of names. I was talking to one of our members today, and she was telling me that her son is the fifth that he's Garth the fifth, his father's the fourth. And I thought, man, when you marry into that and you marry someone who is a fourth, you kind of have to name your kid the same name. I mean, you can't break it up by then. Four generations, if you marry a junior, you can cut that off, even maybe a third. But when you get four generations deep, you can't break that. But I don't have anything cool like that. I'm, you know, I'm not even an Alexander. I'm just Alex. When I asked my dad, why, why, why am I just Alex? Like, why isn't an Alexander? Why didn't you give me some options? And he said, well, look, son, I only had two rules when we were naming you. I said, honey, I don't care what you name the kids. I just have two rules. I want something easy to spell and easy to yell. Those were his <laughs> rules. I thought, well, I don't know what that set us up for, but Alex and Kelly are easy to spell and easy to yell, so here we are. Even our last name is boring. Williams is the third most common last name. 
So when we talk about ancestors, when we talk about that lineage, I don't feel that connection. I don't have that, that innate sense. Maybe you do. I'm jealous if you do, but I just don't have that. Ancestors and mentors aren't really a thing in my family, but they're a huge part of church culture. And I have latched onto that in such a big way because we talk about it all the time. Our ancestors, our mentors, our spiritual leaders that have gone before us. I can name countless people who raised me and taught me and mentored me and challenged me and supported me and shaped me into who I am today. I think about them when I pick up my hymnal, when we read a hymn. Because at the front of that hymnal, there are a bunch of people who signed their name because it was the SPRC committee of the first church I was appointed to. They bought me that hymnal and they all signed it. I'll remember those people at First United Methodist Church of Duncanville, Texas forever. When I read from my Bible, I remember that it was handed to me when I was ordained. When I wear that stole, I remember when James Amerson and Billy Eccles Richter put that stole over me and I stood before all my colleagues in the entire annual conference as the bishop laid his hands on me and passed that down from generation to generation. I remember the weight of that ordination. I remember all of those people who gone before me, who literally passed the torch along to me. Who are the saints in your life? When you think back on your own life, who are the people that shaped you into who you are today? Your family members, friends, teachers growing up, pastors, coaches. Who are the people in your life that shaped you into who you are today? Who are the saints that defined your life? We have a lot of saints in our church that we talk about. When we think of saints, we normally think of like, you know, St. Teresa or, you know, St. Peter or some of these iconic historical saints. But here in Ridgewood Park, United Methodist Church, we have a lot of saints, some still living and some that have passed away. In our insert here, as Dave talked about, you can see a picture of Deborah Colton from the early 90s. For over 30 years, almost 40 years, Deborah has been watching our children in the nursery. So when my kids are in the nursery being cared for by Deborah, that's someone who has done that in that room for almost 40 years. Carrying on that legacy, it takes a true compassionate soul to be with babies and toddlers for that long. She puts up with all of them. Deborah is an institution in our church. And below that, you can see a picture of Jane E. Morris teaching Sunday school in 1977. Jane has been teaching Sunday school for our children for almost half a century. There are fully grown adults who have children in her class who were raised in her class. So many people come back and they say, is Miss Jane still teaching, still teaching Sunday school? And I said, yeah. You think I'm going to ask her to stop? No way. <laughs> No way, man. And I wouldn't dream of it. Because Jane is an icon of our church. She's one of the saints that reminds us who we are, that gives us our character. We have so many saints in the life of our church, those that live in that great cloud of witnesses. Vicki Thompson, Gladys Bates, Jean Wisdom, Evan Farum, Helen Shelton, Charles Whistler. I could go on and on and on about people that have shaped this church into what it is. People whose names remind us of hope and service and leadership. People who are up here inspiring us. Who are working in the background tirelessly setting up decorations on tables. The saints that have built this church we're so grateful for. Yesterday, my kids wanted to watch Moana, which was a good flashback because that was one of the movies that our kids used to watch like four times a day for like six months. So I know every word to Moana. I could probably just explain everything that happens in that movie because I've seen it no less than 2,000 times. And they wanted to watch it yesterday, and I thought, okay, this is a classic. I haven't seen this in a few months. And so we put it on. And I was reminded as I was thinking about today and saying thank you to all of our ancestors, there's a lot of talk about ancestors in that movie. They sing songs about their ancestors who were voyagers setting out on the sea, and she learns from her grandmother all of this about who she's meant to be because of who she is and who her family is. And her grandmother says this, the people who love you will change you, and the things that you have learned will guide you. And she's trying to tell Moana that she's not alone. Her family is with her. Her ancestors are with her. And she responds, I will carry you here in my heart, you remind me that come what may, I know the way. And that's what this text in Hebrews is saying. We carry those ancestors in our heart. We carry those people who have gone to live in that great cloud of witnesses in our heart, and they sustain us. They give us that perseverance to run our own race. We're not alone. We're surrounded by these witnesses, these spiritual ancestors who left a legacy of hope. 
And when you live in the kind of community that the church can provide, you find life-changing relationships. And today, we're saying thank you to all of those who got us to where we are today. Nearly seven decades of hope. Generations that have come through this church, growing and changing lives. We're saying thank you to those who literally built this building and this campus. We are literally standing on the promises, not only of God, but of those who came before who had an idea and a dream to build a new sanctuary. You see in your handout several times where we're breaking ground. We first started in a nursing home, um, and the joke at the time was that people were dying to get into our church. There was a funeral home, sorry, not a nursing home, it was a funeral home. People were dying to get into our church. And then we moved into the building here on Lover's Lane. Which is the joke when I got appointed here, somebody said, see, you're going to the real Lover's Lane. We have a Lover's Lane United Methodist Church, which is a huge church in our conference. And somebody was like, oh, I hear you got appointed to Lover's Lane. And I said, I don't think so. And they were like, no, the real Lover's Lane. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I got here and I said, so what do you call this area? Are we in like Highlands or I'm not from here? And they said, oh, this is the real East Dallas. None of that lower Greenville nonsense. Okay, this is the real East Dallas. And I thought... Okay, there's something going on here about we're the real everything in this town, but there's something special about this place. And as we sit in this building, we are literally standing on the promises of those people who had a dream. So many of them aren't here today. Some of you still are, but we're standing on those promises of God and those members who made a decision to help God change lives in this place, and so they said yes. We're saying thank you to those who inspire us and challenge us. Emma told me that they were, when they were walking to church for us a few weeks ago, um, Abby Orr was looking at all the hall of the pastors. We've got the, all the photos of our former um, pastors in the hallway here. And as she was walking in the hallway, she said, they're all boys. And as she came down, she saw Ann Willett. And she said, ah, a girl. And she turned to Emma and she said, I think there should be more than just one lady. And Emma said, I do too, Abby. <laughs> and as much as that's true, I'm so thankful for the cabinet's leadership and for Ann Willett being here because you can't be what you can't see. And so many people, so many little kids in our church grow up, and if they don't see people who look like them in leadership, they don't consider doing that. That's why we try to empower a diversity of leaders and children and teenagers and older adults and everyone because you can't be what you can't see. And as much as it's sad that Abby only saw one woman in that hallway, she did see one. Maybe one day she'll feel called to ministry and she'll look back and she'll say, you know, one day I saw a picture of a woman pastor on a wall in this church I grew up in, and I thought, maybe that could be me too. That's the legacy that the church can provide. We are able to inspire others by simply showing up and saying yes to God. Friends, God changes lives through the church. Organized religion has a lot of issues. I'll be the first to admit that. It's got a lot of bad press these days. But I will say that organized religion is always better than disorganized religion. Because when I hear a lot of people tell me that they're spiritual but not religious, I think, yeah, that sounds good. It sounds good, doesn't it, to just kind of drop the institutional church and just believe in Jesus? I mean, it's so much less bureaucratic headaches and meetings we got to go to. It frees up your Sunday morning. You could have brunch. Don't have to worry about making the Cowboys game. You're always going to be there on time. It sounds great. But the more I think about it, the more I realize that being spiritual but not religious has a hard time creating community. It has a hard time feeding 5,000 people like we've been doing over this last year. It has a hard time following the example of Christ because the first thing he did was get people together. He gathered disciples together. The first thing he did after resurrection was to get them back together. The first thing God does is bring people together. That's the whole point of Pentecost. We're going to celebrate that in five weeks. The whole point of Pentecost is we come together. We were created to live in community, and the church is the body of Christ in the world. This is what Christ built to change the world. This is the mechanism. This is the tool. It's not always perfect, but this is the way that God wants us to change the world. We are God's ambassadors. We represent Christ to others. And for nearly 70 years, our church has faithfully done that. There's just something special about our church. Now, we're not perfect, but neither were the disciples. I don't know if you've read the Gospels at all and seen, but these guys had a lot of struggles. Jesus leaves them alone for about, you know, 25 seconds, and they're fighting about, you know, who's the best, who's going to get the best parking space in heaven. They're always fighting about stuff. Who's got the coolest nickname? I mean, they always have a fight. It's the Sons of Thunder, by the way. That's the coolest nickname of the disciples. But they're always squabbling and arguing. They weren't perfect either. Christ didn't recruit them because they were perfect. 
Christ doesn't ask us to be perfect. Christ asks us to say yes, to join together in community. We all make mistakes, but when we say yes to God, everything changes. And the people of Ridgewood Park United Methodist Church have been saying yes to God since 1954. And through this campaign, we get to say yes to God again. We get to continue in that legacy. What will our descendants say about us? What legacy are we creating for the next generation? We are ancestors ourselves for people that we won't ever meet. And we get to help prepare the way for God to continue changing lives for decades to come. Friends, our spiritual ancestors got us this far. The rest is up to us. Let us pray. God of grace and peace, you have built something beautiful in this place. You have built a community of love for 70 years. But you didn't call us to build these buildings, pay them off, and then be done. You called us to a life of ministry. So God, help us to join in that legacy, to realize that we get a chance to participate in this now, to say thank you to all of those saints that have gone before us and to join in that work as well. God, there is something special about the community of the church. Help us to feel that today as we say thank you and look forward with hope. It's the hope that you've sustained here, and we know that it's the hope that we can continue to spread. Be with us now and always, O oh God. In your name we pray. Amen.